Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 205th video cast, 195th podcast for the week ending September 21st, 2023. We have a ton to cover today, quite more Ask Me Anything questions than we've ever had before. Uh, so we'll kick it off real quick. I'd really like to thank Chris K and Brian J for having me to their corporate suite at the Cowboys game this weekend in Dallas. Uh, had an incredible time flying out there uh, right here on the 50 yard line and we had so much fun. Uh, they had a bunch of other managers in, VC guys, uh, music royalty guys, uh, private equity guys, real estate guys. Uh, so it was about a dozen of us, and then we had a morning meeting afterward to uh, you know, talk about kind of market views. Just an incredible weekend. And then I had the chance to meet with a new investor uh, uh, for lunch that day that wanted to come in, drove all the way down from Fort Worth, and then was out the next day. So uh, really, again, want to thank Chris K and Brian J. Uh, very grateful for that uh, uh, couple days with you. It was, was a phenomenal time. And also Diana and Marie for... Uh, setting it all up and making it go seamlessly. Uh, that will, was a, an experience I'll never forget. So thanks again. Uh, moving on, want to thank Phil Yin and Ryan Gallagher for having me on CGTN America uh, to discuss general market outlook. We are going to play this one right now just to give you the general overview of how we're thinking about things. Uh, to help us uh, analyze all of this, uh, Thomas Hayes, founder of Chairman and Managing uh, Member of Great Hill Capital. Good to see you again. So if I told you that uh, we're going to raise rates 500 basis points and a year later we're sort of in a situation where we are, where inflation does appear to be in check, yet the consumer seems to have no, no fear, it appears. Are, are we wrong? You're right. We're in a Goldilocks economy. Uh, thanks so much for having me on, Phil. I, I think you've got a situation where uh, money supply, M2 money supply, is still $3 trillion above trend. So the 500 basis, 525 basis points is offsetting that. And then you have people running out of excess savings. So what happens? You would think, oh, my goodness, consumer spending is going to go down, except for the fact that more people are going back to work. Labor force participation rate has uh, climbed to 62.8%, which means we have a greater supply of labor, which is starting to give the employers uh, the upper hand on wages and a lid on inflation. You, you, you mean during the pandemic, people essentially quit or worked less, but they still spent. But now that they want to keep their spending at the same level, they decided they're going to go work and, I guess, keep spending, right? So what does that mean for the next three months? So this, what about the worries about uh, school and university, uh, college loans, and the, uh, the layoffs? I mean, all these things that the bears often talk about, it seems like the consumer just doesn't that for nine months. I remember getting on your show last fall and I was bullish and, and everyone was saying the market was going to go down another 20% after it corrected 25%. And here we are up some 30% off the lows. And I think that's going to persist because uh, despite the bears' uh, absolute confidence that earnings were going to drop another 20%, instead they rebounded and they continue to rebound. As you look at 2024 estimates, they've actually climbed in the last couple of weeks from 246 to 248 and change. And I think they're still too low. So as we get closer to earnings season, you know, if I told you, Phil, uh, quarter's earnings reports is, are going to be up 3.5%, would you be short this market? And the answer is no. And that's exactly what's been happening. Consensus is up 0.5. And for the last few quarters, consensus has been too negative by 300 basis points. They're underestimating the earnings power of these companies. Uh, they're underestimating the normalization, and uh, and we're seeing it in, in the results of the stock market and in the results of earnings. What about Europe? What about China? I think there was some expectation that we'd see Europe perhaps do more, but instead they they just raise rates, in fact. Uh, we're going to make a decision next week. And then China. I mean, there was high expectations for what they're going to do. I know it's still a, a work in progress, but for most investors, they wanted more. Yeah, most investors wanted more. Uh, the Chinese government's been putting out trickle stimulus and trickle uh, rate cuts, and they're starting to compound. If you look at the top internet companies, though, since the crackdown in the last quarter, 
EBITDA was up uh, uh, on average between them about 30%. Revenues were up 7%, and yet you can't find a positive headline anywhere. So I think you just need to give it a little time. They're getting back on their feet. You'll probably see a little bit more stimulus than, than uh, maybe even the government expects to do right now. They've got to bring down that youth unemployment. But we're actually very constructive on China. We think that's a, that's a brand new story that's going to be a tailwind in the coming 6 to 12 months. And we're up quite a bit. All right, so you are optimistic. Where are we supposed to put our money? Well, I think, uh, number one, you don't want to forget about China and emerging markets. Look, the fundamentals of these businesses have improved. Like Alibaba, the price has not for the last year. It's been bottoming after the tech crackdown. I think those are going to be positive. But I, I think also, uh, you know, the ECB is done. So uh, they, they raised and basically said they're done. The Fed will be next. And that means uh, bonds are going to get bid, which is going to help the balance sheet of banks. No one wants banks. We like Citi, which is kind of the worst of the lot. You saw with the Arm Holdings IPO, the game is back on for IPOs. They're going to start making money on the investment banking side. It's trading at a 60% uh, discount to, uh, to book, 50% uh, discount to tangible book, 6.8 times next year. Uh, Jane Frazier realized her job is not guaranteed, <laughs> so she started cutting costs this week, and the stock liked it. It's starting to... Uh, they're getting their efficiency ratio down, and I think it's going to be very constructive moving forward. I, I don't think anybody's job is guaranteed. Maybe, maybe yours is guaranteed. <laughs> I'm my but. own boss, so. <laughs> I so. But I work for my clients, so it's up to them. Look, look, one serious point, people are saying that the banks have somewhere in the neighborhood of seven, $800 billion in these, um, these commercial real estate loans, and yeah. we all know some of these office buildings, a lot of them, in fact, aren't uh, more than 80% full. Yep. Isn't that a concern? I mean, that can't be good. That's why the banks are at these levels. Well, it's a couple of things. Number one, uh, as rates uh, stop going up and normalize, they'll be able to refinance some of this. They'll be able to raise equity. There will be a lot of extend and pretend that people, people are thinking that all of these things are a hard stop. The banks don't want the buildings back. They're going to work uh, with, the, with the, uh, borrowers. Uh, the borrowers. Borrowers are going to work with the lenders. We've been through this uh, many times before. And there's a steep distinction. Vornado. People looked at me like I had three heads. The thing was 15 bucks. Now it's 25 bucks and people can't get enough of it. Why? Because there's a big difference between A properties, the high-end high, high end properties in the good locations that are, have the new amenities that are luring people back to work, and the B and C properties. It's no different than the mall debacle you saw several years ago. The Simon Property Groups with the apples and the Lululemons did well. The uh, uh, second tier malls uh, went out of business, and I think we'll see the same thing with commercial real estate, but we work through the malls and we'll work through the commercial real estate as well. We, we may have to have you uh, submit a top 10 list to our producers, I think, next time so we can track everything. Uh, Thomas, good to see you. And we're back. And, uh, and then uh, lastly, want to thank Fitria Angrayani and Sarifa Rama from CNBC Indonesia Closing Bell for having me on. Uh, to discuss emerging markets, Fed policy, etc. So listen in. Saya bersama dengan Chairman and Managing Member Great Hill Capital, Thomas J. Hayes. Hayes, thank you so much for your time for CNBC Indonesia. So as we know that the U.S. inflation has recently surged to 3.7 percent year on year, up from the previous month's 3.2 percent. So naturally, this has raised concerns and questions about how Wall Street is responding to this inflationary pressure. So how is your opinion on this regard? Well, Leifa, thank you for having me. I, I think the key thing is what we saw in the Fed funds futures market is that rate height expectations following the inflation numbers for next week stayed at around 3%. So there's a very low probability of a hike at the September meeting. And even the probabilities of a rate hike for the November meeting uh, dropped down to 32.6%. It was recently as high as 50%. Uh, I think that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, you saw the ECB uh, do one hike and, and basically say they were done, uh, which implies with the U.S. inflation being much lower that the uh, Fed may in fact be done moving forward. But I think the buoyancy in the U.S. markets uh, overnight was largely due to the Arm Holdings IPO. That This was a big success uh, on the NASDAQ, and that opens the door for many new IPOs and animal spirits to come in into year-end, which will create a lot of fees for the large banks, which is a good thing. 
Okay, so uh, highest interestingly, while overall inflation is running above expectation, U.S. core inflation or core PCPI for August 2023 aligns with uh, expectation. Core PPI for the same period also met the forecast 2.2% year on year. So how do you see this data as a sign of stability that um, maybe the Fed uh, is going to maintain uh, its interest rate on this level right now? Yeah, this is a big deal because the Fed focuses on core inflation, which backs out food and energy because energy, as we know, is very volatile. So this is the, the laser focus of the Fed is core PPI, core CPI. And to your point, they've stayed uh, subdued here on the core PPI at 2.2 uh, and the uh, core CPI in line with expectations. So this sets the stage for the Fed to walk back and to show that they are on target. And that's why I think you're going to see those November uh, expectations of a hike continue to decline as we move towards it and we get uh, more data both on the inflation numbers, uh, but more importantly on the employment numbers uh, where average hourly earnings have uh, started to be more subdued. And, and that's a positive thing from the Fed's point of view. Okay, in addition to inflation, other economic indicators are causing volatility. For instance, U.S. In unemployment claims for the next week, uh, for the week, I, am, uh, I mean ending September 9th, 2023, rose to 220,000, slightly above market expectation. So how do you see about this one and how uh, this will cause uh, effect to U.S. economy? Yeah, so the initial jobless claims came in a little bit lower than expectations. They have been trending up. Uh, the labor market is loosening up, which is a good thing because as people are spending down their excess savings that they received during COVID and they're running out of money, they're going back to work. And what we saw in the most recent jobs report is that the labor force participation rate increased to 62.8%, which means there's a new supply of labor. More people are going back to work, which gives the employers the upper hand and wages have stopped rising, which is a very good thing from the inflation standpoint and gives the Fed cover uh, to start to back away from the aggressive tightening cycle that they've been on uh, for over a year now. So uh, as we see um, more and more people go back to work, uh, wages will remain steady and the Fed can back off. Okay, and despite the inflation data, however, the Federal Reserve in the United States seems to be adapting to a different stance, just like uh, you said earlier that the CME FedWatch uh, tool indicates a 97% prob probability of the Fed maintaining interest rate in the upcoming weeks. So how this will affect the financial market across the globe, both for developing and developed countries, just like Indonesia? Yeah, this is a big deal. So uh, as the Fed gets out of the way and they stop hiking, which we think they're, they're actually done, what you're going to see is a resumption of the downtrend of the U.S. dollar. If you recall, the U.S. dollar strength peaked in October and fell pretty precipitously into the end of the year. And then we've had these counter trend bounces over the last few months, uh, partially due to the debt ceiling, partially due to continued tightening. As the Fed steps away, what we're going to see is a resumption of the softness of the U.S. dollar. And what we know historically over the past several decades is when the dollar weakens and emerging market currencies strengthen, which is our expectation over the next 9 to 12 months, what you see is a massive inflow of investors into emerging market equities and Indonesia and China will be major beneficiaries of that shift. So the number one thing that needs to happen and the team now supports it is the Fed needs to be done hiking, which we believe that they are, uh, which will enable a resumption of the downtrend in the U.S. dollar, which uh, started in last October, which will yield investment flows into emerging markets. And I think you're going to see some very positive equity returns in the region over the next 12 to 24 plus months. Okay, and how about uh, this one will affect to uh, rupiah, for instance? Yeah, well, as the dollar weakens, I think what we're going to see across the board is uh, emerging market currencies and foreign currencies start to gar gather strength. I think the rupiah is going to go up in value. I think that's going to be a function of investment flows once the Fed is done tightening and the dollar weakens, which will also be good 
for uh, the Indonesian stock market and equity appreciation. So uh, I know it's been a bumpy ride for the last uh, 12 months. You've been up and then you've been sideways, but the trend is up. The demographics favor it, the balance sheet of the Indonesian country, low debt to GDP, third largest democracy. Everything is in the favor of the Indonesian economy uh, and stock market for the next uh, 24 to 36 plus months in our view. Okay, and despite concerns over rising interest rates, projections of a U.S. recession have actually diminished. Some experts even say that the United States could avoid a recession in this era of higher interest rates. So are you quite optimistic about this one? Yeah, there's no question. I, I, I believe we are going to avoid a recession. As a matter of fact, we did have a technical recession already last year in the first quarter and the second quarter of the year. GDP was actually negative. So we had the technical recession. So while everyone's waiting for the next shoe to drop, uh, it, it actually happened in the rearview mirror. And as we look forward, what we're seeing is earnings estimates for 2024 are actually going up. Uh, in the last few weeks alone, uh, for the S&P 500, estimates have gone from $246 to $248 and change. That continues to defy all the pessimist expectations. All year long, strategists have been saying earnings are gonna come down by 20%, and the exact opposite has been true. Uh, equity markets have rallied, uh, earnings expectations have gone up, and we believe that will continue to persist moving forward. Okay, one last question, Harry. So uh, once CNBC Indonesia has interviewed Joseph Stiglitz and he said that what the Fed are doing uh, so far is wrong uh, in terms of interest, uh, interest rate hike. So uh, do you agree about this one or do you have other opinion? Well, I think that the Fed wanted to make sure it tamped down inflation uh, if I was king for a day and I was running the Fed, what I would have done is focus more on quantitative tightening, reducing the size of the balance sheet and less on interest rate hikes, because what that's done, it's, it's, it's created a, an environment for housing for we have a lot of millennials. Uh, the largest part of our population is in their early 30s trying to start families trying to buy homes and this abrupt rise in interest rates has really hurt that that demographic in in terms of being able to get new homes so what i would have done is uh reduce the size of the balance sheet and been more moderate on the interest rate hikes maybe stopped around you know three and a half percent and brought the balance sheet down by one to one and a half trillion but what's done is done it's been successful i think now that they back away they maybe will see a couple of cuts next year to normalize things uh, bring things into better balance, and uh, and the economy will continue to grow and, and flourish. So uh, I do agree to some degree with your prior guest, but what's done is done. The economy is strong. The, the excess money supply is there. We do have a lot of money coming in from our infrastructure bills that hasn't yet hit the economy. So we may, in fact, need a little bit of that insurance, and, uh, and we'll progress moving forward. Okay, so what done is done, and the economy is uh, still strong right now. So thank you so much. Uh, Thomas J. Hayes as a chairman and managing member Great Hill Capital for your time for CNBC Indonesia. See you again someday. Thank you so much. Have a good day. And we're back. Uh, so now just quickly want to thank Adita, Sony, Samritha, Arun Salam, Bansari Kamdar, Anyana, Rajesh, and Arshia Bajawa for including me in their article on Reuters today. Uh, uh, about um, Rupert Murdoch stepping down and Lachlan uh, fully taking over the reins over at Fox. Uh, incredible uh, biz counterbalance business that he built over the years. And then I want to thank uh, your Yuvra Malik and Adita Sony for including me in their Reuters article, as well as uh, Bansari Kamdar for including me in her article. Uh, and finally, the quote of the week. Uh, this is by Warren Buffett. Games are won by players who focus on the playing field, not by those whose eyes are glued to the scoreboard. This is really important, and I think this is a great theme for today because we're going to go through some of the positions that we've talked about recently on the podcast and with the you know short-term seasonal volatility of September that's uh, pretty common 
Uh, it looks like on a day to day basis, it feels like, oh, God, red every single day uh, until it turns. It's always darkest before dawn. Uh, but in the scheme of things, in terms of what we're looking for, we're not playing for 10 or 15 percent moves in any of these companies. At, at, at the very least, we're looking for doubles and in most cases, triples and beyond. Uh, and those take time. And um, uh, and if you get trapped into the day to day for exogenous events affecting the price, but not affecting the underlying value and the underlying earnings power and the underlying turnaround story, uh, you can really get knocked out of life changing positions and, and opportunities to to grow your wealth fast and, and or not fast, but double and triple your wealth over time. And I just see it over and over. It's kind of like the people who plant seeds and they don't see the sprouts coming up through the ground. They, they keep watering it. The sun keeps coming out and all they see is dirt and all they see is dirt and all they see is dirt. But once those sprouts come out of the ground, the stalks grow extremely fast. And what people forget oftentimes is they keep digging up the seeds to see why isn't it growing. And they have to keep starting over and starting and over and starting over. Plant the seeds, trust the, the process, trust the water, trust the sun. All the hard work is being done for you. You don't have to keep digging up the seeds and starting over because then you just have to wait again. Uh, plant with the right right type of seeds and you'll get the harvest. You just have to be patient and, and that's the price you pay. But the hard work is done by the people running the business, operating the business, growing the company, turning it around. Let them do their work. You do your work by doing the proper inputs beforehand uh, and all battles are won. Uh, all wars are won before the first battle is the key. You have to plan that out. You gotta know what discount are you getting into intrinsic value? Where would you think this would be fair value or an excessive fair value where you would consider laying some off, depending on where the fundamentals are at that future point in time? Maybe the fundamentals are better than you think they'll be, in which case you want to hold it for longer, uh, or they met your target and you want to get out. But you never get that opportunity uh, if you keep focusing on the short term scoreboard and get knocked out before you let these things grow for you. I uh, want to cover, uh, cover a couple indicators here just to give you an idea of where we are. This is the 10-day put call here. This type of spike up level is what you see near bottoms, not near top. So, uh, you know, you just have to hang through this uh, short-term noise, Fed noise. Again, the NASDAQ 1% EMA, this is barely working itself up. It looks a lot like this move here in 2017. Looks a lot like this first move here in 2013 before multi-year rallies. Um, this declining issues tricks has spiked up. That's when it bottoms. So you see this type of stuff. NASDAQ Cohen high low, same story. That's what you see near bottoms, not near tops. And we just have to keep reinforcing these. Uh, the real estate, as much as it spiked up, there's still a lot to go. It looks a lot like this scenario before it took off. Uh, looks a lot like this scenario in 2018 before it took off, which by the way, was near the bottom in bonds. Uh, top and yield. So, you know, these things just keep repeating themselves. And if you have the context and experience, which we try to impart with you from our, our decade and a half plus of experience uh, going on too, uh, these things play out. Here's the mid cap intermediate term volume momentum oscillator. Again, that's what you see at bottoms, not tops. Uh, so you just play the probabilities. Nothing is perfectly foolproof, which is why we take hundreds of inputs, both fundamental and technical and otherwise, but predominantly fundamental and, uh, you know, PMO by, by SPX. So over and over, just a reminder, nothing, you know, uh, you know, extra magical here other than giving you context on a week to week basis when it looks grim out there. Just recognize that's just people positioned off sides. And more than anything else, the reason you see abrupt moves is because people play with leverage and they chase the crowds. And then when when it's, you know, they're chasing tops or chasing bottoms, and then when it turns, they get smoked out and that leverage causes the abrupt moves. And that's why we always say, uh, as Buffett has said, the three killers, ladies, liquor and leverage in excess uh, lead to bad outcomes. And if you can avoid those three things in excess, you'll do just fine. And that's a function of patience and um, taking the longer view where the rewards come. Uh, speaking of longer rewards, yesterday, uh, that new putter is working. I, I had some some people leave feedback like, you know, that's kind of the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Uh, but I shot a 38 on the front, which is my best ever, uh, beating a 39. And uh, and then a, as I did when I shot the 39 on the front, I shot a 51 on the back. This time I shot a 38 on the front and a 45 on the back, 
but we're moving in the right direction and uh, you know year just over a year into the game and uh, tomorrow the member guest got canceled but i'm still having uh that gentleman up who uh invented stack and tilt mike bennett very excited for that we're gonna play with a friend of mine and, and his guest uh and have a wonderful time so maybe he'll give me some pointers and uh uh, get that last piece in so I can meet my goal for the year of breaking 80 one time before the end of the season because I beat breaking 40 one time. Now I've done it twice. Uh, so we'll see. But the putting has been an enormous factor. And um, and it's no different than investing. You know, you find where your you know weak points are. For most people, it's impatience, analysis, and experience. It just takes time. Uh, not dissimilar to golf. And then you find a way to fill that gap and you do it. You be patient you refine it and you keep going like anything else consumer discretionary this looks oversold that there's going to be some opportunity there we'll be talking about that uh energy looks overdone by the way we're going to talk about that these are bullish percent uh indicators by the way by sector financials that's interesting that it looks a little bit overdone here because um that uh I'm trying to think what what issues are in the top weights that would be causing this because most of the banks are not <laughs> overbought so i'll take a look at this but it could be this first type of move before it gets going same thing you saw in 2012 and 13 first spike up then a pullback and then you get you know stays elevated for some time that's probably more in line again here's that 13 to 15 and 16 to 18 scenario that seems to be playing out again with the other indicators uh, gold miners not interested. Healthcare, that looks like it's sticking up. We have that represented through uh, XBI, a derivative play, and then uh, industrials looking a little bit oversold here. Even tech, again, just um, starting to catch its breath. And NASDAQ. So we just go sector by sector. Real estate, you know, popped up. Like Renato, it's come back down here, retracing. I think that's ready for another run in, a, you know, probably a couple of weeks. Uh, Staples looks a little oversold here, actually, which is kind of interesting because all the things that get oversold when rates peak are interest rate sensitive. Staples, utilities, real estate, uh, et cetera. So these, if, if this is true and we're near bottoms for these groups, then um, what would coincide with that would be uh yields compressing and <laughs> no one will have that view this week after yesterday's uh fed meeting but we're going to talk about why that might be a fake out and uh what we're paying attention to to give us that view here's utilities oversold so all the things that go up when yields compress are now at um areas where you want to be a buyer which tells me yields are going to compress uh pretty imminently and uh, you could probably find no one on wall street that would think that after yesterday's meeting so a uh, couple of the names that we've discussed in recent weeks in the just getting started uh, article, nothing has changed. You know, I mean, these things are these are the type of things. These are just bottoming process. And the reason I'm showing charts is just because the fundamentals haven't changed. And in most of these business, the fundamentals have actually improved or stabilized. Uh, but what we're seeing is uh, the prices, which are less important to me than the value, but the prices are at levels of extreme that uh, historically uh, portend reversals, okay? And you can always say this time is different, but if you just look at some basic indicators, these are getting stretched, and these are levels at where uh, you, know, you start to find some you know, complete exhaustion, you've run out of sellers, and things start to revert back up. So, you know, there's advanced auto parts. Here's uh, Amazon is, is, you know, as big of a move as it's had. You know, it's kind of just getting started. It's on the first leg up. This thing, will, you know, it's taking a breather right now. Uh, they're hiring 250,000 people for the end of the year, which tells me that uh, they're doing just fine. Here's our favorite Alibaba, which, you know, you can't give away this week. But at the end, it's just doing the basing process that we've covered for many, many weeks. On a day-to-day -day basis, it looks like the end of the world. When you zoom out, I mean, this is no different. You have your first bottom, then you have your retest, then you have another fake out, and then you go to the parabolic move. You have your first bottom, then you have your retest, then you have your fake out, then you have your parabolic move. So most people won't stick around for the parabolic move. They'll chase it somewhere up here. We'll get another big pullback. They'll get puked out on leverage, and then we'll go back to new highs. And people will say, what the hell happened? I thought China, I thought it was the end of China. And, uh, and just as they start to chase 
three to five years out when this thing is well above uh, fair value and at new highs, but guess what? It probably will be the end of China and we'll be laying off and helping them out for all the Alibaba they want. We've got plenty to lay off uh, at much, 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 much higher levels than right now. No one can see it right now, so borrow my glasses and uh, hang tight. Moving right along, Bank of America, simple pullback. Everyone thinks the banks are done, you know, with this Fed, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, the Fed, I have my notes here because <clears throat> uh, Kayla Aristivo called me this morning to go on Charles Payne. Um, and um, um, so I got my notes ready. So grateful for that, for her thinking of me. Um, they had a guest and blah, blah, blah. Long story short, it's getting rescheduled to, uh, or, you know, I think the second week of October or whatever, because uh, uh, et cetera. But in the context of the notes, what I was saying to her was, you know, we got exactly what we expected from Powell yesterday. We got a pause and we got a threat. <laughs> and that's never gonna change because they have to manage expectations lower. Uh, they want to act as dovish as they can, but they've got to talk as hawkish as they can. Otherwise, inflation expectations will spiral and change behavior in the present. So as long as they keep threatening, we're going to uh, stay tight forever. Uh, people won't get scared about future inflation. If they don't get scared about future inflation, we won't have future inflation. Uh, so they're doing exactly what they need to do. It's just the market is is has to act silly from time to time after big moves. And this is one of those times. And it is September and all the noise. But as far as Bank of America, nothing's changed. And if you zoom out, like Buffett says, stop looking at the scoreboard. It's probably five or six percent, if not more, correction this week. You can barely see it on a long term chart. It's just making higher highs and higher lows, higher highs and higher lows, higher highs and higher lows. That's what we call an uptrend, ladies and gentlemen. But on a day-to-day -day basis, people say, oh, we're going to hell in a handbasket, blah, 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 blah. I mean, look at Baxter, okay? Medical devices, no one wants, you can't give them away. They haven't been this oversold since the great financial crisis when it fell from 23 to seven. This time it's fallen from 90 to 30, high 30s. And, um, you know, it does the same thing. These are different extremes that you see. RSI hit this level in 2009. It kind of hit it in the tech wreck. It hit in the, the late 80s. And uh, these are levels where you re see reversals. And we've gone through the fundamentals already, so we're not going to do that again. But when you look at the day-to-day, -day, when it goes from 45, you can hardly see it on the long-term chart. Uh, when it goes, but, uh, it goes from 45 down to 38, so that's seven points. That's like 15% in a week. People are like, oh my God, I got to get out. I got to get out. And if you get out, then you miss this type of things when it went from seven to 29. So you don't like 300% in two years, then get out. Or, or three years, then get out. You know, if you don't like uh, four to 12, so 200% gain in a year and a half, then yeah, you should get out on 15% moves. But you don't get the 400% if you can't take the 15%. And that's really what it comes down to. You know, to get, you got to give. And in the case of investing, when you've done your work for quality businesses, I'm not saying do that with crap businesses, uh, you sit tight and you get paid for having the stomach volatility strength that most people don't have, which is why most people don't outperform over the long term. They underperform because as the study happened with Fidelity, they found a common denominator among all the highest performing individual accounts had the same exact characteristic. And when they did the extensive study and spent thousands of dollars to figure it out, what they realized is the best performing accounts were the accounts of people who have been dead for 10 years or more and forgot about their accounts because they didn't sell anything and it went straight up. So <laughs> that's, that's the name of the game. City, same thing. It's just doing the bottoming process. It actually already bottomed here. It's doing the first check back just like you saw in 2011. I mean, these things over and over and over, and these are not bases for making decisions. These are just confirmations when there's noise in the market and you say, are we still on track or are we off track? Because I can't find anything in the fundamental process. If, as a matter of fact, everything I look at shows things are improving. So why isn't the price improving? Because that's what price does. Nothing goes straight up. And, uh, and these are designed to be the heart-wrenching things that take the weak sisters out so you can either add more or sit tight so you can get your multi-bagger while everyone else gets butt kiss. So, um, you know, Cooper Standard, uh, here's an easier chart. Same thing, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs. I'm surprised we kept a higher low with all this um, uh, 
uh, UAW nonsense going on. But so far, so good. We'll see how that plays out because if they can get that resolved uh, in some reasonable amount of time, I think this could work back to new highs uh, pretty quickly. And, uh, and that would be exciting to say the least uh, and a major, major contributor for year-end performance. So, um, you know, we take it as it comes. Disney, same story. We'll read some of the news clippings, but it's just noise. You've had three chances to buy this thing at a 50% off markdown price. Wall Street's the only place in the world when they hold a clearance sale, everyone runs out of the store. It's it's mind boggling to me. Best parks, they're going to put 60 billion into the parks. People think that's a bad thing. Oh, wait, you, they're going to build the moat even higher that no one else can replicate. And the market thinks that's a bad thing because they're going to do a little capex and focus on the business that matters. I think they're cre I think they're setting the stage to uh, focus on those profitable high moat businesses and maybe uh, uh, um, peel off some of the non-core businesses that, that have been headaches. I mean, you know, you see all kinds of figures thrown out around about ESPN. I think if Apple wants to get into the content business, they should, you know, pony up a check for 50 billion for ESPN and that would cover the CapEx. And then all of a sudden you'd have $150 stock and people say, my God, what happened? How did I miss that? Well, you missed it because like in 2009, when you could buy it 50% off, you had your head between your legs and you were kissing your ass goodbye instead of buying stock. And the same thing during the tech wreck. You miss these opportunities for classic businesses, best parks in the world, uh, best content library in the world, and um, and you don't get them back. So that's the story. Does it go to 70 before it goes back to 200? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not, but I want a piece of it, and that's why we own it. Generac, same story. Uh, you know, similar type of thing in 2014 and 15 when we saw this type of correction. You get your bottom, you get your rally, you retest it, knock everyone out, you get these type of little checkbacks, and then you go straight up. And this thing was back to new highs within two and a half years. So in this case, I'm not saying we're going back to new highs, that would be 350%. But you know, I think this is an easy double, and then we'll see what the fundamentals look like from there. You know, for those things, we're gonna talk about end phase in one of the ask me anything questions. They're solar with solar walls and solar batteries, and people think that's the future. Let me explain something to uh, uh, some of the folks that don't understand. If you have a very expensive, nice house, the last thing you're gonna do is throw ugly solar panels on your roof, that I can assure you. So for those of you who think that uh, um, uh, solar is gonna take over the world, number one, the vast majority of the country doesn't have great setting for solar, and number two, uh, it's not as reliable, and when, you know, everything is out. You want something that's reliable. You want that natural gas or the propane to kick in and you want your house to be handled uh, for as many days as it takes. If you're in the Northeast, sometimes that's as long as a week. Uh, and, um, you know, every now and again, you may have to uh, refill the uh, natural gas every three or four days, but uh, uh, you'll be good to, or you just hook it up to your house thing and you're good to go for uh, as long as it takes for the utilities to figure out which way is up. So Google, Again, you know, it's had this first check. So now maybe we consolidate for, you know, three, four or five months. So do we want to sell it and pay a ton of taxes and give half the money to the government? Or do we want to wait for a couple of years and get another, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 points out of this? I'll take the latter. Um, Intel. OK, this was perfect. Remember at 25 when I was talking about this and everyone, no one wanted it. Well, I mentioned it at 38, everyone's super excited. And I said, guess what? Now everyone's excited, it's gonna pull back to the low 30s. So we're back to 35. Maybe we'll get to the low 30s, I don't know. But look, we've already bottomed. We're working our way higher on the PC and the um, and the server business. We, it's a 50, $60 stock. Gelsinger was out with the um, uh, new chips, uh, uh, this week, the number two, and then the number three is going to be the big one. And he basically said, for those of you who think uh, NVIDIA is the only game in town, uh, you got something coming to you. So let's see if he's right. I would bet on him because, uh, you know, as great as Jensen Wong is, he wasn't uh, mentored by Andy Grove. And uh, I think there may be some surprises in store for Intel. Wait till the market gets a hold of uh, possibility to invest in AI with some other ticker other than one trading at... Uh, 100 times earnings and 25 times sales. That's that's mind boggling to me. Um, and, and, and then the consistent narrative now, as you see all the commentators, well, it's cheaper now that it's up 100 points than it was three months ago because they raised guidance. I mean, that, that's like, I can't even begin to explain 
how much of a mistake that rationale is. But leaving that aside, um, it is what it is. NVIDIA is a great company, but you know we were on Yahoo in June uh, when everyone was you know tripping over themselves to get the much stock, and we said we would you know we we would take a pass at these levels, and uh, it's pulled back ever since. It uh, doesn't mean it won't go to new highs at some point, but um, you know, I am perfectly comfortable with errors of omission, missing opportunities. I am not comfortable or accepting of errors of commission where I actively uh, engaged. So um, sometimes you just have to take a pass because statistically speaking, if you get the one NVIDIA that worked at 100 times uh, earnings and 30 times sales, you're going to have 999 other companies. Just ask Kathy Wood, who you bought that you know, type of valuation, and they got roasted. Uh, and by the way, her fortunes may be changing in a positive way, too. We're going to cover that. Uh, who would have thought? Uh, so there you go. Uh, IWM, this is small cap. I think this is a very similar uh, setup to 2009 to 2011. Get this monster rally off the 2020 lows. Then you get this consolidation and then you you make your new legs higher and um you know it's it looks similar so these patterns repeat they're never exactly the same but when you zoom out and look at the playing field versus being focused on the scoreboard day to day even regional banks so same thing off the 2020 lows big spike up then you just grind for a few months before you go higher so what do you do if you grind do you sell it and find the next thing and keep uh digging up your seeds before you have your tree well, you can do that, but you'll never have the tree. You know, the old saying, uh, those sitting in the shade under a tree planted the seeds many years ago. Well, this is the exact same story. 3M, okay, look at this. I can't even see the check back this week. So it's, you know, went up from 90 to 110. Now it's back to $198. Uh, but nothing's changing other than the fact that this is an extreme. You know, we are we are at levels where we see selling exhaustion and we see bounces like you did during the great financial crisis and back to new highs within uh, a year and a half. And you could say, no, this time's different. They have legal things. Well, that time you almost had all the banks run off a cliff and you had a once in a 72 year credit cycle collapse. Uh, I would say that time was different. I would say this time is like, you know, it just they'll just muddle through until they figure it out, get the spin, get the money to pay off all this stuff. PayPal, same thing. It's building this base. It's at an extreme. It may go a little lower before it starts to recover. But at 10 times, you've got a margin of safety. Um, we could go, we, maybe we'll go through some of the fundamental stuff next week. But there have been a lot of positive developments. Uh, none of um, more important, I, I think, than bringing on the CEO from that business unit of Intuit, which was one of the fastest growing companies in the history of the stock market. And he was responsible for 50% of that growth. He did it through acquisitions, which is PayPal's. Uh, game plan moving forward. Then you've got um, emerging marketplaces. These won't work until the dollar turns. I think we're getting at, at that point here. We had kind of this knee jerk yesterday to the Fed, but I think you're going to see yields compress, the dollar resume, and, and we'll talk about that in the article of the week. Then you got the Stanley Black and Decker, same type of situation. You get these bottoms. And then you take out the lows, then you go up and you check back. And it looks like we're kind of up and at the check back, just like during the great financial crisis, you know, or it could take longer like it did during the tech rack. But these things work away because they have moats. I mean, Craftsman, Stanley, I mean, you know, what is there to think about here? You know, can you think of like a competitor that's worth its salt? Not if you're a mechanic or anyone, a construction, if you're doing any infrastructure package stuff, hundreds of billions of dollars coming in the next two years, you might want to have some tools. And then you got the TLT, which we'll go into here again at an extreme. Does it go back down and test 89 or 80 or overshoot to 87 before it takes off like it did in 2018? We'll discuss that. Uh, VF Corp, same thing we touched on putting in that bottom, putting in that extreme, like the last two recessionary cycles. And, um, you know, it just continues to repeat. Uh, Vornado, so it shot up from 15 to 25 or 27. Now it's gonna breathe for a little while. Everyone's gonna panic out. You're gonna see all the headlines come back. Commercial real estate is terrible. Banks are terrible, blah, blah, blah. So maybe it pulls back down to 20 or probably 19 to scare the living daylights out of everyone before working back to intrinsic value of 35 or 40. We're not gonna be heroes. We'll probably dump out at a you know two and a half X 
and call it a day. XBI, this thing feels like death, but it's no different than any other body bottoming cycle of 2016 to 18 when you had that tightening cycle. You get the rally, you get some consolidation, same thing in 08 and 09, you get the rally, you get this little pullback. Everyone thinks it's the end, but it's basically done zero since last May when it bottomed. Uh, and it continues to just be a headache until it goes. And when it goes, if it's a, at 2010 to 2014, it's a 300% gain. If it's a 2000 16 to 2018 tightening cycle will get back to new highs and that's just monster upon monster gains but you don't get that if you keep you know staring at the scoreboard and looking at your p l every single day and put you know ripping up the seeds i better do something i better change something you know i was talking to someone the characteristics that make great entrepreneurs are the exact opposite uh, characteristics of what make great investors. And that's a conflict because people often think it's all just being smart. Problem with the super high IQ people is they've always got to do something 24 seven uh, days of the week, the 160, 150 IQ people. And um, and the way to make money is to do your work up front and then sit sit back and do nothing. And that takes more discipline than running around with your head chopped off trying to find the next thing chasing a couple points here and a couple points there uh, whereas an entrepreneur gets paid and becomes very successful by taking massive action being firm willed um, uh, being consistent uh, and just acting until something clicks investing it's not acting until something clicks once you have your seeds planted it's actually watching and and um disciplining yourself from digging those seeds up too quickly and losing the whole harvest. That's the name of the game. Uh, so there we go. We went through that. Warren Buffett's intrinsic value mantra might lead you to boring companies, but predictable cash flows. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? Uh, this I thought was interesting. 1-800-Flowers executives bought up stock. The reason that um, I like this headline is because uh, I met Chris McCann in the green room from some TV hit I did uh, a, a while back, and I was very impressed with him. Uh, and if this guy's buying, and he's historically always known when to buy his own stock. So the fact that he's in the market, I don't think it's a great business. I don't know that I'll do anything with it, but um, uh, I think it probably works. And I'll just show you, let me just pull up the chart here. Yeah, so this thing's pulled back from 40 down to six and he's buying stock here. So that's interesting. Now, you may buy stock here like he did and wait a year and a half and it does nothing. Oh my God, it looks like biotech. And then he got from 250 to 13 in the next year and a half. So, you know, 400% something, uh, give or take. Uh, and then another, uh, then he tripled again. So, um, you know, that's... That's the type of stuff that I pay attention to. Uh, hunting season on banks might be over. This is from Carlton English, the best bank reporter in the business. We agree. Um, strike. UAW can't bring the 50s or wish EVs away. You know, I heard one of these union leaders talking about um, in the 50s and 60s, uh, being an auto worker was a way for, you know, uh, to ascend into the upper middle class you know things change you know in the 50s and 60s um you know we manufactured um toasters in the united states as well i mean it's just it's just as you become productivity increases standard of living impre increases um you can't have all the benefits you know in the 1950s you couldn't buy a television for inflation adjusted $200 that would be 80 inches on the wall of your house and uh, get the, you know, all kinds of content for $14 inflation adjusted uh, to the comfort of your home. I mean, so things change and this offer is going to have to change. But I think the ultimate backfire is going to be positive for um, uh for the OEMs, because I think what's ultimately going to happen is they're going to agree to more than they should. Either they'll shut down all the factors and drain the UAW fund and just say, you can do your mini strikes. We're going to just shut down all the factories. We're going to fire all the non-essential people. We we will um, let the essential people strike, lay off half the workforce. It's an opportunity to cut costs. Uh, let the essential people strike until the UAW runs out of money in another four weeks. Uh, and then bring them back at an even worse deal than they already offered, or 
they will agree to 30 or 40 or 50 percent and maybe they can do a two hour work week maybe that would be sufficient because they want to get more pay 40 percent more pay for 20 percent less work um you know so maybe they give them double the pay for half the work and they do that for a year while they build a bunch of factories in mexico and then just close all the u.s factories next year so they got their pay increase for 12 months rather than coming to a reasonable conclusion and having a job for the next 30 years and participating in the EV boom and having an amazing thing. And I'm not saying one side's right or wrong. These people should get a, a raise, but you just can't compete with Tesla. You can't compete with uh, Kia. You can't compete with Toyota. Uh, you're just not gonna be able to compete with non-union. So you, we can have a taxpayer bailout, bailout every eight years for making dumb deals uh, for labor, or we can make a dumb deal and just push everything offshore. I think that's the direction it's going to go. And Fain is going to go down as the, the person who sunk the U.S. auto worker, ultimately, if he if he holds out. Uh, alternatively, I'm wrong and they come to a great deal over the weekend and everyone wins and that would make uh, too much sense. So uh, low probability of that happening, but we'll see. Uh, Disney to quiet the noise in a culture wars amid Ron DeSantis feud, Bob Iger. So here's the pragmatist. Uh, those, some of you liked my thing, you know, if he's got to, he'll do Bible shows 24 seven to get EBITDA up, you know, cause of the complaints that uh, go woke, go broke. Uh, and here he's showing his pragmatism. He's going to dial down the noise with all the uh, political rhetoric and just focus on business. And that's what we want to see. Iran's oil exports have soared during the quiet diplomacy with the U.S. We're going to cover this a little bit in the article of the week. But, you know, everyone uh, clamoring for energy stocks at all at uh, at or near highs. No one wanted them at or near lows in 2020. And by the way, if I remember, banks and uh, banks and uh, and energy, you know, we bought Wells Fargo. I think it was at 25 and wrote up to 58 and then. Uh, Exxon at like 33 when oil was negative. But both of those took like six months before they started. Certainly the banks took a long time. I think the energy stocks went up pretty quickly. But, um, you know, that's what you get. But you don't dig up your seeds. You know what you own and you hang tight until you get your doubles or triples or whatever you're looking for. But you've already predetermined. You fought the battle before the war. Uh, you, you know, you've won the war on paper before you fought the first battle is the name of the game. So uh it, oil's coming um and uh and um biden has said as much i'll drain the whole damn reserve if i have to to get elected oh he didn't say those last few few words but um you can read between the lines disney to invest 60 billion in theme parks and cruises everyone thinks that's a bad idea i think it's a good idea um bank of america the stock especially if they get 50 billion for some non-core assets that would really uh, make a lot of sense uh, the stock market is primed for a 25% rally in the next 12 months. These six industries hold the best opportunities. Now, the person making this call uh, on the 25% rally is the same person who, when the stock market was at 3,700 and 40, and then it went up to 4,000, and then it went up to 4,200, then it went up to 4,300. They were still calling for a correction of 3,500. Now that we're at 4,400, now they're calling for new highs. But that's the way it works. Opinion follows trends. The thesis is that uh, while um, cap weighted indices are at high multiples, equal weighted uh, are at reasonable to low multiples, we agree. And then they go into their picks uh, and of course they're chasing. So they want energy equipment and services at the top. So God bless. Fed predicts soft landing for the economy, low inflation and no recession from your lips to God's ears. Don't screw it up. Uh, don't snatch defeat from the jaws of victory by over tightening. I don't think they will. As a matter of fact, the odds as of uh, recording this of a no hike before the end of the year are 54% even after yesterday, according to Fed Fund Futures. Here's another one from the great Carlton English, best bank reporter and financials reporter in the business. Square and PayPal are getting new CEOs, what it means for their stocks. So we've gone into that as far as PayPal matters. Uh, Square, we don't really love Square. It's second best. And um, uh, they, they've kind of been all over the place. Uh, Cash App is a lower end business. So uh, for us, it's a pass. Uh, it probably does fine. It probably trades in line, but you're having a higher starting multiple for a lower quality business. And uh, that's not for us. Util utility stocks won't be this cheap for long and their dividends still shine. We agree that's going to be a function of uh, after we get through this overshoot in bonds and the yields start to compress, those will fly. 
as Alibaba stock slides, employee number 52 still believes in its Tao. So he's basically making an argument. There's something special about Amazon. And now with all of Jack Ma's proxy, uh, Amazon, Alibaba, with all Jack Ma's proxies now running the show and all the newbies out on the street, uh, we're back to business. And uh, that was reflected in last quarter's earnings. That's going to continue moving forward. And as they continue to unlock value, but none of that matters until the dollar uh, stops going up and we start to get emerging market flows, they'll be the major beneficiary. That's been the thesis since day one. Sounds like the same story every day, but when you zoom out, you realize that um, we're right in line with what it normally takes for these businesses to bottom after corrections, and it happens every few years, and you just sit back and don't dig out your seeds and just wait um hedge fund ad china stock shorts even as growth bottoms now zero hedge is a bearish blog and even they get it um uh, so you know there are signs of things turning around and uh and yet uh we covered last week hedge funds are the most short since they were last fall before alibaba doubled in 12 weeks i think we're right on the cusp here even if we have to wait a few days or weeks, it'll be what it'll be. China economy shows more signs of stability on policy boost. No one wants to hear that. China frees banks to lend more money in latest attempt to spur economy. China may dodge deflation after all. China boosts economy with second uh, re uh, reserve requirement ratio cut this year. PBOC adds more cash into the economy as recovery gathers pace. Uh, and from commodities to retail, China's economy is showing signs of life after Beijing's stimulus frenzy. So they keep adding fuel to the fire. It'll eventually catch. And when it does, uh, it'll go without letting people in. So uh, when that happens, it could be tomorrow. It could be next month. It could be in three months. But I, we think it's imminent. Um, what a girl wants stock market and sentiment results. This is our article of the week. Uh, I know I'm going to get some pushback for choosing Christina Aguilera's hit song for the article of the week, but hear me out. Uh, if you recall from our podcast video cast last December after, and you can pull them all up here, by the way, after the energy sector was up 376% off the COVID lows, all of the commentators, commentators who hated energy in 2020 at the lows couldn't get enough in December of 2022 because tech was, quote, dead. Energy sector has made zero progress ever since. In the first few months of the year when it failed to perform, the same commentators couldn't sell out fast enough as we approach the December 2022 levels once again, they're back tripping over themselves to chase up. One of the reasons we suggested to taking a pass on energy at the highs last December was that sectors that the sectors that everyone hated were poised to have the highest earnings growth in 2023, namely tech, semis, etc., while sectors that everyone loved, energy, utility, staples were set to have the worst. People bought what was up in price with no regard to what they were getting in value, fundamental terms. So uh, energy, here's what happened, did nothing. Here's what happened, XLK and SMH were the highest performers of the entire year. Christina Aguilera had it right when she said this, what I want is what you got and what you got is what I want. Uh, that's basically how the stock market operates. Opinion follows trend. When everyone wants it, everyone else wants it. And when no one wants it, no one wants it. That's when we step in and then we get ready to lay it off when everyone wants it. So in the United States, the song spent, okay, so what? It was top of the list, yada, yada. So while we believe in the intermediate term secular story in oil, we made our play from 2020 to 2022. We'd, we'd reconsider, but it needs to get to much lower prices where the margin of safety is so great that you, you can invest with a crayon versus a scalpel. The top holdings of the five sectors that will have faster earnings growth than the S&P 500 in 2024 are as follows. Communication services, infotech, consumer discretionary, healthcare, industrials, and uh, one that'll be uh, just slightly less than the S&P, which we like is financials. And what will have the worst earnings growth that everyone can't get enough of is energy. Same story uh, as tech last fall. Um, um, so what a girl wants is energy because everyone else has it. Or as Christina said, what I want is what you got and what you got is what I want. Uh, and what a girl needs is what's going to grow the fastest and, and uh, where you can find the lowest value. So you go sector by sector. Here are the top weights and you find those which are marked down that have tremendous value that no one wants. Uh, here in communication services, we already own Alphabet. 
Um, but take a look at Disney, for instance. So we own Disney, uh, but that's marked down. So that's kind of interesting in our view. Again, everything is opinion, not advice. We do not know your financial situation. We deal exclusively with accredited investors and qualified institutions. See your financial advisor and talk to them before doing anything. Click on terms, etc. cetera. Um, consumer discretion, uh, Infotech. So a lot of these are already up, but if you dig down, maybe past the top 10 holdings, you could find some values. Consumer discretionary, Amazon we already own. Uh, Nike's been beat down to death. We don't own, we're looking at. Same thing with Starbucks, why? Because they're both on China fears. Uh, I think booking is still beat down. Maybe we'll take a look at that, but there are things to do. Healthcare we have re represented through um, biotech, which you can't give away until it starts to move and everyone will be chasing up at new highs. Industrials, we have a, kind of a derivative with Stanley Black and Decker. We got 3M. Uh, etc. Some of these defense stocks are getting beat down, even Boeing. Some of these things are, are worth probably starting to look at. And then financials, Bank America, City's not even in the top 10, but we own that just because of the margin of safety, not because it's the highest quality, but because the margin of safety is pretty, pretty darn big. Um, if they liquidated it tomorrow, you'd probably get a double. So the key is to finding the companies in these groups that are most undervalued relative to peers with gross prospects ahead and taking advantage of the recovery. If you're a regular listener of our podcast, videocast, you know a number of the stocks we own along with our clients. So while everyone chases energy up by the breakout, quote unquote, you can take solace in skating to where the puck is going versus chasing after the bulk of the move has occurred. Uh, those are the media things. As it relates to this outlook, there are two most important charts to watch in coming weeks. One is this US dollar. We want to see this start to reverse after a fake out and the TLT, which is the 20 year Treasury bond ETF or the 10 year note you could look at. We're going to look at both. But again, you know, all we do is play probability. So you can see these are at extremes where every single other time it's inflected. Even the time it, quote, didn't work, it did inflect about 10 percent before it didn't work. Um, that was one one instance in 2022. And then the next instance, it worked for more than that. Uh, looked like about a 18% bounce. Uh, and here we are back again. And then if you look at the 10 year note commitments of traders, uh, this shows uh, commercial record, commercial he um, hedgers are record long, same positioning they had before the inflection in 2018, whereas hedge funds are record short bonds. I always wanna take the other side of that trade. And, uh, and what's interesting this time, as much as we would have liked a double bottom, if we're being honest, the, you know, historically you get overshoots to flush everyone out at the end. Everyone's going to be selling in the hole saying, oh, you have a technical breakdown, just like you have a technical breakout. And it's all often a fake out to suck the last idiots in short. Uh, and that's when they rip their face off and they all have to cover. And that creates the initial new buyers when you get these parabolic moves higher. So um so whether this takes a couple days or a couple weeks or whatever it takes it really is immaterial the key is i think we're at an inflection point we got the overshoot and that's also the thing you want to see in these um uh momentum divergences where you have price going lower while uh relative strength is is trending higher and we finally got that price lower i think we got it i don't know or we're close to it on the TLT for sure. On yields, we definitely got it. So that that I guess is all that matters. Um, so those are those are kind of the divergences that um, we like to pay attention to. So the other thing that uh, should be of note is ten-year Treasury bond returns. Uh, you you know this would be the first time in 250 years that you'd ever have three years in a row. I wouldn't make that bet. We're down negative 1.5 as of. Uh, you know, a day ago, maybe it's 2% now, if, if that. But um, I think by the end of the year, this is going to turn green just as it has every other instance, whether it was 1960, 1957, that you had two years in a row, uh, sooner or later, it pulled off that third year positive. I think we're going to find a similar situation this year. The Fed, what's got everyone rocked? I mean, he did what we expected. He 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 paused and he threatened. Hawkish talk dovish action but they changed the dot plot and people got so freaked out that they are only doing two cuts i hope they don't do four because if they're doing four it means we're in a recession so you want them to do two next year because uh like like 95 to 99 where you had 
uh, they basically kept the Fed funds rate at 6% and you had the biggest growth in the stock market in history because you had strong nominal GDP and that's the that's the way to get out of uh, debt to GDP of 120% is to let inflation run above trend, keep saying you're going to bring it down, keep letting it run hot and let growth accelerate and uh, get the debt to nominal GDP down uh, and get the balance sheet back in order. So that's that's the story there. No, no big surprises. Uh, Fed statement, you can go through it, but ultimately it doesn't matter because the inflation break evens are at 2.27%. And that's all you need to know. It's lower than it was in 2011. It's lower than it was in 2013. It's lower than it was from 2004 to 2007. And that's all the Fed really cares about. They, they actually want real infl want inflation up and expectations down is the Goldilocks scenario. Um, sell Rosh Hashanah, buy Yom Kippur. The Fed gave us what was expected. Pause hikes and threaten to do more. No major surprises. But we are in the calendar and just need to sit tight through a little air pocket. So we're in that period of the year. There's this, uh, I got this study from Yat, Rackus, and Williams, 100 years of data. Uh, it's substantively a uh, period of the year where you get negative real negative returns. Uh, sell Rosh Hashanah, buy Yom Kippur. We're right in the thick of it, Fed meeting or not. This is a weak time of year, worst 10 days of the year. You can see this data from Ryan Dietrich over at Carson. Uh, but the, that's the bad news. The good news, in case you were wondering, uh, for the buy Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is the evening of Sunday, September 24th uh, through Monday, September 25th. So we probably see some inflection uh, people probably won't go into the weekend long, but uh, but but they'll play catch up. So we'll see what happens there. Equity sentiment is still at levels. You want to be a buyer, not a seller. We've covered that many times before. Uh, um, AAI sentiment, same thing, kind of neutral to negative, uh, et cetera. Oil and, oil and gas equipment and services, earnings estimates for the top 30 weights in the last 60 days are down. 4.1% and 4.6%. So why is everyone clamoring to buy it? Because they're chasing price. Opinion follows trend. <laughs> it's the worst performance in the last six months. It's one of the few sectors where estimates are going down. It's going to be the lowest earnings growth for next year and people can't get enough of it. So help them out and uh, and lay off whatever stock you have is our view. ARC, on the other hand, which you can't give away, which you know it's not my cup of tea, but their earnings estimates in the last uh, 60 days are up 33% for this year and 145% for next year. Now, if your earnings estimates were 50 cents and they go up to a buck for 30 stocks, that gives you a high percentage. But the key is they're moving in the right direction and no one wants it. So those are the contrarian things that we look for when intrinsic value is increasing and price is decreasing. Those inflections make sense. Uh, as far as the economic data, the jobs information came in a little bit better than expected this morning. That didn't help with futures, especially when everyone's afraid that they're going to stay in longer now. Uh, but if you look out to the CME data, there's still 54% chance of no hike, better than a coin flip. So, uh, And that's after the worst possible time they could do that. After the hawkish speech, they'll parade out their friends over the next week and maybe walk a little bit back if they want to after Yom, Yom Kippur. And um, we'll go from there. I mean, that's, that's what the calendar, that's the seasonality. And let's get to the Ask Me Anything questions, which there are an amazing amount of Ask Me Anything questions. Hi, Tom. You gave a recent positive nod to the Cisco Splunk deal on Reuters. I remain long on Cisco despite its fairly sideways trading since 2019. Uh, I would say fairly, fairly sideways trading since 2000. Um, so you can see it here. Basically done nothing in uh, 23 years. Um, is this a game changer for Cisco? Martin Floriani. It's not a game changer. We don't own Cisco. We, sh you know, I don't know. Maybe we should be looking at Cisco because this does look a lot like Microsoft looked uh, in 2013. It had gone sideways for like 15 years and then it took off. So maybe Cisco is worth a look. I don't think Splunk is the catalyst for that, but it's just kind of cheap and out of favor. That's our knitting. Uh, so maybe I'll take a look at that. As a matter of fact, why don't I do that right now? Let's see what Cisco's doing these days. Oh, 
Okay. And I think it's had a recent run, so I'd probably have to wait for some weakness, but uh Oh, that this deal, by the way, is gonna be accretive on a cash flow and gross margin basis within the first year. So that's pretty pretty exciting. Um All right, so cash flow for share is starting to finally reaccelerate after being flat for a number of years. Um, what are they doing with stock? They're buying back stock. A pretty decent clip. Top line is growing again. Yeah, you're probably getting like 10 times the business for the same price. Um, yeah, this is this is one that I think we're going to do some more work on. Hopefully we get some weakness and hopefully we can find a slot. Um, maybe with some new people coming. By the way, congratulations to all the new people that came in. If we didn't call you back because we got <laughs> more than we expected uh, people coming in. If we haven't called you back, please reach back out. It just got lost in the mix. It's not that we don't like you or want to do business with you. I think we got to everyone and everyone is now pretty much funded and finished their applications. And most of you, we've deployed capital into this weakness, which we're excited about. Um, but uh, do reach back out to us and we'll get you into this round. Um, Vinod Nemagoda. All right. Thanks for your podcast. It's uh, beneficial, especially when you hear a lot of bears talking on CNN and other places. Uh, suggestion, don't watch CNN. Seems to, <laughs> seems following is true. Bulls make money and bears look smart. Uh, question is related to Square. Are you looking into this stock? Is it beaten down similar to PayPal? Um, or you cover these financial bets through PayPal? We like PayPal, so I just think it's a lower quality business with Square. I'm not really fully confident about management over there. And um, did I even pull this one up? Let's see. Yeah, Block. So Block. Moving in the right direction. Eh. Ah, they're diluting their shareholders. I, I don't like it. I, I just, you know, I saw how they ran Twitter. I know they've changed their CEO. I, I think the culture is backwards. It's not for me. T. Latap, um, Capri will be, bought. by the way, thank you for the question. So the answer is we own PayPal versus Block. I think both will probably work, but I think your odds are much higher as it relates to um, PayPal over Block. But they're going to take time. They had heart attacks and it is what it is. Uh, Tila Tap Capri will be bought out at $57, but is trading at $52. So potential for a 9% gain. Is this something you would consider? Uh, I presume there's regulatory risk, but could be a nice workout play. Maybe not actually as you would pay half to the government as it completes soon. Yeah, I agree. I think it'll work, but, um, I mean, you can play those things with leverage. People do it for, for a living. Uh, it's not what we do, but yeah, it probably works and, you know, good find. Uh, it's, it's an all cash deal and I don't see any antitrust in that space unless the government's completely off their rocker and, and now companies are just suing the government and winning in court like you saw with Microsoft and Activision when the government's acting unreasonably in certain instances. Uh, Chris, Christoph Stawanoga, why did Alibaba decide to fully split? They're not splitting it, they're spinning it. Um, the cloud business. Why not keep some interest in the business? You're getting the interest as the owner. The reason is, is because it can it can work on a standalone basis. Uh, and if it can, it should. And that also takes the target off of Alibaba's back from being too big. So, you know, if you've got $200 billion companies versus one $300 billion company, you're flying under the radar, you can raise capital, you get a better multiple, and it's just a clean break. And it's the way to do it to unlock maximum value. As far as the others, like the Freshippo and all these other that are going to IPO and they'll hold them for a little while, eventually they'll spin it fully to shareholders. So then you'll wind up at some point with, the, you know, uh, five companies worth a cumulative trillion plus and, um, uh, all will be small enough to fly under the radar and to grow and raise outside capital and incentivize management properly and have their own individual stocks, which will be great. 
Jason Zen, keep up the great work. Was wondering if you could look at Enphase. They are a competitor to Tesla Powerwalls and Generac, but solely focus on solar and battery storage and solar inverters. They recently expanded to Australia and is 60% off at all time highs. Lots of insider buying, usually below the 150 mark, currently at 123. All right, Enphase is growing their cash flow, good news, growing their earnings, good news, uh, growing the amount of shares outstanding, bad news, growing their revenues, good news, but it's slowing down pretty dramatically. Uh, and that's not what you want to see in a growth story with a super high multiple. Uh, four, uh, four times, so, so 30 times. I guess you got to see how fast they're growing their cash flow. Um, I don't like anything related to solar because it, it runs so cyclar, cyclically. Um, you know, I, you know, you, you've got the whole group. As a matter of fact, like a couple of these, like Sunrun came across. They're all smashed. Um <laughs> These are the the irony is these would probably start to work if Trump got elected. I, I hate to say it, but it's like, you know, when uh, Biden got elected, the energy stocks went crazy and the solar stocks went to crap. When Trump got elected, the energy stocks went to crap and the solar stocks rallied. So it's it's the exact opposite, which is why you never invest on the basis of politics. Uh, I I would I would just pass because the solar stuff is commodities. These solar walls. Uh, to, to the points that I made, you have to have the ugly things on your roof and most people with nice houses don't want that. Um, but, um, there's a place for it. So if it got cheap enough, I'd take another look, but just because management's buying, I mean, there was a company called Asana that some analysts recommended to me. It's like, Oh, we got, you know, you got to buy this because, uh, the insider is buying and blah, blah, blah. And he bought all the way down. So, you know, sometimes they buy their own hype. And uh, if it's a broken growth story, it's a broken growth story. Uh, this doesn't mean, like, I think your framework is okay. And I think it's a good question. And I think it might work. It's just it's just not for me because I don't have an edge. I, I don't predict the future. I don't know which technology is going to win out. I know Generac is going to work. Generac is going to have a major share. That's not going to change anytime soon. Because when you're buying backup, you don't want to take a risk. You're already in a risky situation. You want something that's going to work and that's going to be durable. And we know Generac has worked. It's worked forever. It's going to continue to work. And they're just working through the inventories and the game's going to be back on. So Bob Johnson, can you take a look at Unity Stock U? It's one of the two largest game development engines in the world, primarily dominating the mobile game engine market. About 50% of the mobile games use Unity to develop their games. They all have tooling and assets to make game development easy and they have the potential to expand the verticals outside gaming such as construction manufacturing uh da 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 so uh, stocks 50 percent off close to 50 percent 75 percent from all-time highs um brand leader all right so this is called unity as a general rule i only invest in companies that have a long history of being public and are currently out of favor and the fundamentals are okay. Uh, but let's take a look here. This Unity software, okay. So the revenues keep going up, that's good. They keep losing money, that's bad. Uh, they got $1.6 billion of cash. $2.7 billion of debt, losing cash from operations. Mm, they must have some equity securities that they're winning on. That's interesting. They could probably use that to raise cash. They issued more debt, uh, negative free cash flow. That's not for me. I'll leave that to someone else to gamble on whether they're going to be the winner in the space. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. But that's not what we do. We like predictable, durable businesses that are proven that we can understand through different cycles um, and make doubles. So if something like this works, maybe you get a five bagger. But, you know, for every five bagger you get on something like this that's losing money and promising the future, you get 999 donut holes. And uh, we're not interested in that. Uh, Tom L. Uh, asked about Aspen and ECC. So let's pull up Aspen.
Okay, so it's come down a lot. Looks kind of interesting. Let's look at the fundamentals a little bit. What do these guys do? So the revenues have gone up. So they're getting more contracts. They continue to lose money, which they've mastered over the last uh, handful of years. Their balance sheet, they've got some cash. Let's see. It doesn't look like they have any debt. So you can liquidate it at about six bucks. That's good. So you got some level of margin of safety. Uh, they, they're blowing cash from operations, blowing cash from investing. Why are they losing a lot of CapEx in their business? And free cash flow yield negative. Um, now, this, this is not the type of thing we look for. It doesn't mean it won't work, but uh, it's like every on our checklist, every box is not marked. So uh, let's try ECC. I think ECC was one of these opaque um, REITs with like a 16% yield. Um, so they do um, close and fund. They do MES and junior debt tranches of collateralized loan obligations consisting of primarily below investment grade U.S. senior secured loans. I mean, you can do this. All these guys run with leverage and it works like magic until it blows up. And um, I would be um, passed. I mean, their interest income's going up. That's good. Uh, their They've got 40 million of cash and they've got um, 200 million of debt with leverage. Ah, they're a little too leveraged. You're paying a 16% yield. I think you're just gambling for 16%. Why not just take a business that could double over a few years and get a 30% IRR and call it a day? I don't want to mess with that stuff. You chase yield, you, you always get burned. Katie Modi, um, thank you, Professor Hayes, for this real time education and value investing. Thanks for listening. Uh, uh, can you please explain what you mean by commercial hedgers or buyers? Always early and right. What makes them always right? I'm biotech. Uh, are you still in biotech? And he says, and don't, and please don't be nice to those Canadians. F can Okay. Where, all right. uh, this guy is interesting. Um, the commercial is always right. I mean, you can look at the position. It depends on the instrument. Um, but they're the ones with the better information that large speculators and hedge funds are gambling on price and they're usually trend following at the exact wrong time. And um, in the case of being short, they're the first buyers. And that's what we're looking for in terms of treasury, a 10 year treasury note. Um, so that's that's predominantly the difference. It doesn't work on every instrument, but it does work on the ones that we talk about it in the podcast video cast. Nate Kelsey. By the way, so in the in the case of like grains, for instance, the commercial hedgers and buyers would be like General Mills. They have like perfect information because they're in the business on the ground. Um, farmers, um, large, you know, uh, Archer Daniels Midland would be in that commercial hedgers, and uh, you know, so they've they've um, you know sold the crop. They've uh, they're growing the crop, and they want to lock in some price. Uh, they have kind of the best feel, the best on the ground information. Those are the smart money. And then you got guys who've never been in a cornfield placing bets, shorting in the hole or buying at the top uh, that you want to take the other side of. So um, Nate Kelsey. Uh, thanks for the podcast. Extremely helpful. Developing long term investment framework. Um, uh, I don't hear you discuss short positions on the podcast. Um, how do you express? So, uh, number one, there are times to be long and times to be short. We will take short positions from time to time, and we have the latitude to do that with our partners. Uh, but we do that 
exclusively when there's asymmetry. And by I mean, when I say asymmetry, in those cases when things are so extreme on the upside that there are no marginal buyers left, and premium is selling at such a discount, volatility is subdued because prices are high, and we either want to hedge out the portfolio, um, or more more appropriately, we want we see asymmetric downside where we can get exposure at a very cheap price and maybe make five to ten x in a relatively short period of time, and we would express that through long premium exclusively, and we would limit that size. Uh, that said, we would never discuss any shorts publicly. Um, it's just not what we do. And we don't discuss most of the positions we own for our clients publicly either. That's their intellectual property and they get the benefits of that. Uh, Juan Gonzalez, um, thanks for all the great content you provide us every week. Just want to ask if you could take a look at JetBlue. It's obviously losing cash, but at this price, uh, book value seems pretty cheap to me. Um, I think you might be right, Juan. Let's take a look. All right, so your cash flow positive. Uh, share count's gone up a little bit. We don't like that. Revenues per share is going up. Price is not. Revenues are going up. People are worried about price wars again. Um, and uh, these are also trading down because of gas prices. So people extrapolate. It's called recency bias. People extrapolate the most recent thing, i.e. oil at $90 is going to mean oil is going to go to 120 And maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but it won't stay there forever. High prices cure high prices. So um, let's take a better look. I think this is good for a trade. Uh, again, opinion, not advice. And, um, you know, the, the airline business is never a good business to own. These are good business to rent. You date them, you don't marry them. Um, plenty of cash. Modest amount of debt. Liquidation value about 10. Generating cash from operations. Where are they spending all their money? Cap, a lot of CapEx. It's such a crappy business. Um, they repaid some debt. It's okay. They probably, you know, it's a little bit of a leveraged balance sheet. Their cost of capital is going to go up. But. I think that business travel is going to continue to accelerate and that's really not in the numbers yet, just like China travel. So, you know, something like this, it can take a while to bottom, but I think, uh, I think your instincts are correct. Even if it takes a year to bottom out and move back up to 15, you're probably doing okay. The question is if you buy it at $4 and it goes down to two, are you going to puke in the hole? Cause it didn't, tri you know, triple overnight, or are you going to hold it and wait till it goes to 15 and you have a triple off your basis? And, um, that's only a question that you can answer, but uh, Juan, I think you're on the right track, my man. All right, Zachary Illies learned the butterfly this summer, feeling strong. Disney chart below, am I missing something? All right, so he sent me some technical chart about some technical pattern. Uh, I think that's just noise, Zachary. Why don't you read a couple of the annual reports, understand the business, uh, and see whether or not the quality of the assets and the quality of the business warrant your investment dollar and whether you'd want to be an owner of that business or not. As far as patterns, that's for a different podcast. That's not what we do. Raymond Roberts, uh, thanks for all the info you continue to provide. Big fan and look forward to your weekly cast. Thanks for listening, Raymond. Appreciate that. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on Pfizer or if you could do a quick rundown on it. I'm holding shares, but thinking of putting that money to work elsewhere. Interested to hear what you think about them. All right. Um, Okay, Pfizer. Okay, so it's pulled back from 60 to 32. It's had modest gains since uh, 23 years. It's gone from 22 to 35, so not big gains. It's been kind of dead money for people, although they do pay a pretty big dividend, if I remember, I think about 5%. Um, 
4.88%. So I would own this over T-bills every day of the week. Everyone's rushing into T-bills to get 5%. I would buy Pfizer and just wait for a triple over the next 10 years. It's a much better deal than T-bills. But leaving that aside, let's take a quick look-see-loo. Here we go. Okay, so they had this spike on the vaccines in 2022. Now revenues, are, uh, earnings, or cash flow is moving back to a normalized, more normalized level. So it looks like they're trading at about eight times cash flow, uh, about 10 times earnings. Their historic multiple is 14 times. They also have, by the way, for all the hype around Wagovi and um, uh, Manjaro and all the uh, weight loss drugs, they are working on a oral version of that. And I think if that comes out, I think it's going to go bananas. So this is a sleeper where you're paid to wait, where you have a free option. If they, if they have success with this oral thing, if it works as well as Manjaro and the other thing, and hopefully these, these things don't start, you know, killing people, uh, I would say that you're going to have a monster. So I'd never bet against that guy. I mean, um, I'd be a hold if I owned it, and I might be interested in buying it, to be honest with you. Um, I don't think it's going to be a monster, but I, 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 um, I'm kind of interested. I mean, it depends where you own it from. If you own it from 10 bucks, maybe you take a little off, but if you own it from 60, I, I wouldn't be selling in the hole. Um, and I might even think about putting new money to work with that. But um, we have exposure through biotech, which we like better because we have the catalyst of deals and drugs. When risk finally comes back on, when when everyone realized Powell is just you know bluffing. Um, Ron Amchin, any thoughts on SoftBank? I pass. I think that guy was reckless with his bets. You know, he he has a long term history of success, but I I, I mean. Um, some of the actions he took during the pandemic just seemed, you know, a little too cowboy for my liking. I think he sold Alibaba in the hole. I, I think that was a mistake and because um, he had to. So I don't like anyone that gets that leveraged and that cowboyish. It's not for me. Uh, I respect the guy. He's accomplished great things. I would never bet against him in a million years, but I'm not going to I'm not going to play with the cowboy. Uh, Sophia Emma. Free cash flow yield on BABA is tremendous, over 13%. On a free cash flow basis, okay, we did that. How long do you expect BABA to remain unpopular? Uh, until it doesn't. <laughs> until price goes up. Opinion follows trend. At some point, this value has to be recognized, right? Yes, that's the way that works. Sophia, um, I probably should do a jo good job of welcoming you to the podcast <laughs> because... Uh, I think you're spot on here, but we, we, we've covered this a lot. Uh, we'll continue to cover it, but these things take time. Uh, let's just, you know, back to the future here and cover it again. Um, you know, you've had basically here, this bottoming process took about uh, a, a, almost two years. And then you got a parabolic move. This one took almost two years. You got a parabolic move. We're only at about a year and a half. So maybe a couple more months of nonsense. And then we'll be off to the races once again when everyone figures out what the value is. The way they'll figure out the value is because price will go up first and then they'll chase price. And then all of a sudden everyone will start to realize how valuable it is and it'll just be a benevolent spiral. And then when it's above intrinsic value and all the people that were negative on China at the bottom start to get excited, we'll help them out. And um, and we'll be off to the races. So Randolph Haggerty, uh, what's your view on the UK? Seems like a lot of all around hate, which makes me have a look there. Sp uh, specifically look at Motor Point PLC. It's an auto dealership since it's a Lithia or Asbury, but smaller. Um, Uh, I like UK for the same reasons, but we expressed it through Rolls-Royce, which is up quite a bit already, but we think just getting started, this is levered to uh, servicing on engines, which uh, uh, will come, it's just really starting its way back, but, you know, huge thing up from a buck to three bucks. Um, 
at a tiny position in uh, uh, ASOS, but uh, Rolls Royce is our primary exposure there. So let's take a look at um, MotorPoint PLC. The thing I worry about with auto dealers is that the I think the volumes are going to be so high that their margins are going to compress. And that doesn't affect us as much because we get paid for volumes with Cooper Standard. Um, the OEMs and the dealers get paid for margins. So I, I'm not bullish on auto car maker. I'm not bullish on the OEMs or the salespeople. I'm bullish on the ones that provide the picks and the shovels for the gold mine as they race to the bottom on price as uh, they ramp up production and um and then have to do the incentives um all right so is this it motor point okay so the revenues are still growing losing money they got five million of cash and they've got uh Hundred two million of short-term borrowings. Those are probably floor financing, I guess. Um, that could be a risk in how they have to roll that with having so little of cash. That's probably why your stock is down. Cash from operations uh, looks okay. Uh, this one's a little hairy, my friend. Let's see. Um, yeah, I'd have to do a little more work on their balance sheet. It's pricing in bankruptcy and that they won't be able to refinance. Uh, and with the amount of cash, I have a tendency to believe them. Why did they need to exist is the number one question you need to ask. Uh, if it works, you know, you'll probably have a triple, but I think you're cutting that one a little bit close without a clear catalyst. Uh, but I like the thinking, that's for sure, and it may work. I think you got to just get more comfortable in their in their full uh, balance sheet and cash flow statement and understanding the business and the volumes and all that stuff. It, it may work. I think that's kind of interesting, but uh, probably cutting it a little too tight for my taste. Justin from Montana, you consistently mention uh, taking profits when stocks exceed, reach or exceed intrinsic value. Are there any businesses that are so well run and profitable that you look to hold them together? A la Berkshire Hathaway with their Coca-Cola position. Um, this guy has Apple. Um, you know, we are different in that we tend to be running into the theater when someone has already yelled fire and run out. So when we're buying the businesses that we buy, it's at such aberrationally dislocated prices that if we get a 40% IRR in a few years or 50% IRR in a, you know two, three years, we're gonna lock those profits in. And, and yes, there are some businesses that are worth holding forever, but some you know, knock on the door, doors of law of large numbers. And we also operate from kind of a general context of in entropy, like, um, over time, things can deteriorate, um, uh, and uh, you know, usually we're buying it when they're turning around, putting in new management, and and fixing it, uh, or if it's just temporarily impaired on price. So, you know, we're just looking for doubles or triples plus over a couple, two, three years, and rinse and repeat. Um, are there any businesses that we would hold forever? I mean, we'll see what Amazon's doing when it's at new all-time highs. Uh, Alibaba, no. Anything in emerging markets, no. We, we're bearish on China's demographics after the next three to five years. When their 34-year-olds move to 38 or 39, I think they're done, and I think they're done forever. But if you, as you know from Japan, you get the biggest parabolic move in the shortest amount of time 
when that big bubble of population goes from 34 to 39, um, as we've seen in the States as well through, through the different cycles. So um, picking those is easy in retrospect. Uh, it's very hard prospectively. Uh, but if they continue to compound capital at above average rates and I see no impairment in their moat, there's no reason to really sell them and pay taxes to the government. Uh, and there may be a few that we do hold, US-based companies that have high quality molts. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Alphabet could be one, uh, Amazon could be one that we bought during the, the crash last uh, fall. Um, uh, you know, we bought uh, Wells and um, um, uh, Exxon during the pandemic lows. Those are not businesses you hold forever because they're not high quality businesses and they didn't have high quality uh, management was fine, but the energy business is a cyclical business. And, and a lot of times these turnaround businesses, as good as they are, they're cyclical businesses. That's why you get such an aberrational discount every cycle uh, that would never be even entertained in a boardroom of a private company. And that's why I love public markets and I rarely do private deals because private none of these prices would ever be considered at to, to take these companies private that they're selling in the public markets. And that's uh, amazing. Plus, you have liquidity on top of it. You're not locked up for five years like you are with private deals. And your IRRs are much higher and it's more tax efficient and you don't have to deal with K-1s and uh, all those great things. So I love what I do and there's a reason I do it. Um, yeah, I mean, if Coca-Cola was marked down 40% one year, I'd probably hold it forever. Um I think the answer to your question is we put on a lot of positions for a lot of new and existing clients that when they reach intrinsic value, we'll see what the fundamentals look like. And if there's been no impairment of the moat and they're compounding capital, we'll hold them as long as it makes sense to hold them. But by and large, when we've hit our predetermined targets, are if the fundamentals are where we expected them to be and they're trading at aberrationally high multiples, we're going to lay them off and start again and, and get more of those 40 to 50 percent IRR type of opportunities. Patrick Olson, um, love your show podcast, trying to set up a portfolio with your picks. Is there any way to get the percentage allocation for each stock you own? Yes, become a client. That is the intellectual capital of my clients. Are you kidding me? But thank you for watching and, uh, and you don't have all the stocks that we have and you don't have the full comprehensive thing. This is about explaining to people a framework. We're teaching you how to fish, we're not giving you a fish. And if you're taking it as giving a fish, you're always gonna lose because if you don't know why you own something, then you're not gonna understand when you're looking at the scoreboard and the score is against you and you dig up the seeds that you planted and while we're harvesting a huge tree in two years, you're gonna be nursing a loss because you didn't know what you own. So the idea of this education is to really contribute value, make you think for yourselves. And most people are gonna say, look, I got to focus on what I do with my career. This has been very valuable education. I'm going to just lay off that responsibility to you because that's all you do 24 hours a day and you've been doing it for decades. Uh, that That's what I want to do. And most people do that. But for uh, someone that's learning, I think there's probably from my context of how I do things, there's no more valuable way to do this than to listen to these free podcasts. I try to give a tremendous amount of value that took me many years of experience to, to learn. And a lot of you, by the basis of these questions, are benefiting immensely from, from listening. So I'm appreciative and um, uh, grateful for that. Anurang Gupta, what are your thoughts on doximity? Uh, doximity. Uh, let's see. Doximity. Here it is. Uh, it's only been public for a couple of years. 18 times forward free cash flow, 10% growth. Uh, you know, it's not growing the top line fast enough to have that kind of multiple in my view. But... Um, it's not bad. Let's take a quick look here. D O X D O C S. Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay, so it is growing revenue pretty fast. 
kind of decelerating the growth rate. Um, making money balance sheet looks good. Cash flow looks okay. Financing. So they, oh, they repurchased common stock. Oh, this is interesting. Free cash flow. Year. This is worth studying. I think you've got something here that's kind of interesting. Um, but now the process begins. Annual calls, annual, I'm sorry, quarterly calls, at least 12 of them, three annual reports. Look at the S1. Um, You know, the thing about these cloud-based digital platform for medical professionals, I, I I have to do so much work to understand how is there a moat and how aren't there going to be 60 others of these cutting into their business. So once I understood that, then these financials would make sense. Uh, the Tang Tangney Skewart family owns 26%. So I got to figure out who these people are. Officers and directors own 39% of the stock. These are positive signs as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so I'd want to know who this guy is and what's his history of success in the past. And I think that might be worth a look -see loo So yeah, this definitely warrants more um, Exploration and your uh, good look. It usually is not what I look at, but I think it's kind of interesting. Um, Lars Lundstrom. Oh, I don't know if I covered this last week. This was last week. He had this um, semiconductor AFX. I don't know if I could find it. Let's, let's just see if I can do a quick look for him. Carl Zeiss. Mm, free cash for positive. Uh, cash, how much debt? Or current assets, total receivables. Just don't seem to have cash. I gotta double check this. Um, but it doesn't appear they have debt either. Income statement. Um, so they're growing again. They are making money. And I guess they're in a semiconductor medical technology company. Devices. Um, yeah, this probably warrants further exploration. I think you're on the right track, but it, it requires a lot more work. So I would say it's worth to start put to put in the work and do the calls, understand the competition. Um, and move in that direction. So and you're right, good job there. So thanks for everyone tuning in this week. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.